This is the continuation of the discussion on the responses to altered respiratory function. So this is the second part. Uh, this will continue on assessment. Please take note of this disclaimer. If you have any concerns, you may pause the video and read through the disclaimer. Now let's talk about gathering objective data for your patient with respiratory problems. So we're doing physical assessment. One thing that we can watch out for for our patient is clapping. So clapping is common as an indication of hypoxia. Okay, clapping of the fingers is found in cyanotic or hypoxic conditions, especially among people with chronic lung infection and malignancy. So when I say clapping, it is about the thickening of your fingertips. Then we have cyanosis. So we know that cyanosis is bluish discoloration of the skin. Okay, so in this case, your cyanosis is evident if at least 5 gram per deciliter of unoxygenated or deoxygenated hemoglobin is present in our body. If you can recall, the average normal hemoglobin is 12 to 16. If at least 5 gram per deciliter of this hemoglobin is unoxygenated, it would result to cyanosis. Then we have the upper respiratory structure assessment. So when I say nasal flaring, other references would refer to this as alar flaring. This indicates increased respiratory effort. Okay, this is oftentimes manifested by the redness of the nares or the nose of your patient because the patient is exerting additional effort. Now you also watch out for the color, swelling, drainage, and bleeding from your upper respiratory tract structures. So drainage and bleeding could be indicative of trauma it could also be indicative of internal injury. So your drainage and bleeding could be a sign of your epistaxis, which could be caused by a ruptured artery or blood vessel inside the nasal cavity. On the other hand, drainage, there are different kinds of drainage. It could be a runny nose, which could lead to watery drainage. On the other hand, if the patient had an injury, and then the patient is manifesting with glucose-containing drainage, you would suspect CSF leakage. Then we have nasal mucosal membrane assessment. So your nasal mucosal membrane would appear to be red. Okay, it's more red than the oral mucosa. However, in allergic rhinitis, which is common among our patients, it appears to be pale, engorged, and bluish gray. Now for the mouth, pharynx, trachea, and larynx. So for the mouth and pharynx, you can watch out for discharges, okay, especially the presence of your post-nasal discharge. Oftentimes, your patient would complain that there is something foreign on their oropharynx. Now, you also check for edema, okay, if there is edema or ulceration, and enlarged or inflamed tonsils. Cut one, the image on your right is an example of an inflamed tonsil with pus deposits. So this tonsil could be graded from 1 plus to 4 plus. 4 plus means kissing tonsils. The tonsils are close to one another in such a way that the patient is unable to swallow anymore. Okay, looking at the tonsils of your right, that would be a grade of 2 plus for the tonsils. Next, you also check for the use of accessory muscles. So when I say accessory muscles, these are muscles that are not supposed to be used okay, during respiration. However, because of excess effort on the part of the patient or the need of the patient to expand his lungs, okay, he's using accessory muscles. So examples of your accessory muscles are shown on the picture. So you have your sternocleidomastoid muscle on this side. You also have your scalenus muscle or your scalenes, and then you have your trapezius. So whenever the patient is breathing and you can see that this part of the patient is rising, meaning the patient is using accessory neck muscles for breathing. We also assess for the lymph node of the patients. So if you note that there is tender lymph node that is usually movable, that would suggest inflammation. On the other hand, if the lymph node is hard and fixed on the surrounding tissues, you would suspect malignancy. Okay, again, if it is hard and fixed, you would suspect malignancy. Whereas if it is movable, it is just an inflammatory process. Now, look at the lymph nodes on the slide. So these are the lymph nodes that are being emphasized to you during your health assessment classes. So you have your preauricular, your parotid, your tonsillar, your postauricular, you also have your occipital, your cervical, okay, your submental, submandibular, 
your posterior cervical, and then your supraclavicular. So whenever you're assessing for the lymph nodes, you need to check for these lymph nodes. You also need to check for the lymph nodes in the chest area, okay? especially going towards the armpit of the patient to the arms. We also assess for the larynx. Oftentimes, examination of the larynx is done by an expert using a laryngoscope. So when I say laryngoscope, it is an equipment used to visualize your larynx, okay? That's why it's referred to as laryngoscope. If you would look at this image, okay, below, this is a laryngoscope which is being used for intubation purposes. So if I want, or if the doctor would insert an endotracheal tube to our patient, the doctor will be using the laryngoscope. So this one is a laryngoscope with a curved blade. On the other hand, for assessment purposes, there could be a video laryngoscope. So this one is a video laryngoscope, which is used if the doctor would want to visualize the larynx. Okay, laryngoscope could be done as an OPD in the clinic setting. At present, because of COVID-19, a lot of anesthesiologists and a lot of doctors are using your video laryngoscope. So your video laryngoscope, you don't need to get near the patient for you to visualize the larynx. Instead, you can just visualize the larynx from the camera here. Okay, At least that will maintain a reasonable distance from the part of the patient. Now, if you will be assessing the larynx, you also need to check for abnormal voice, such as hoarseness of voice. Your hoarseness of voice is the initial sign of laryngeal cancer. Okay, so hoarseness of voice is an initial sign of your laryngeal cancer. Now, trachea. So take note of the location of your trachea. So trachea should be assessed for its position. It should be midline. The trachea can be mobile, but there should be no tenderness and there should be no masses present. Now, for the lung and thorax assessment. So one thing that we can do is to check for impaired movement or unequal expansion. So we can do or we can check the expansion by observing directly the chest of the patient and then the posterior aspect. Or you can place your hands just like the picture on the slide. So if ever there is impaired movement or unequal expansion, this indicates your lung or pleural disease. This is indicative of lung or pleural disease. Next, purse lip breathing. Oftentimes you will see patients who is doing purse lip breathing, just like the one shown on the picture. Purse lip breathing may be an indication that your patient has asthma or COPD. Okay, your purse lip breathing is in fact a technique that can help people with asthma or COPD. Okay, especially if they're having episodes of shortness of breathing. Your purse lip breathing can help control shortness of breathing and provides a quick and easy way to slow the pacing of the breathing. Okay, making each breath more effective. Because the tendency is, if you have asthma and then you're catching for your breath, the tendency is that the patient will have short breathing. Okay, so short breathing would be hypoventilation, okay, or somehow it would not be a complete respiration. So the tendency is for carbon dioxide retention. However, if you would want the breathing to be more effective, you can use your first lip breathing. So again, oftentimes seen among patients with asthma and COP. Next, diaphragmatic breathing. So when I say diaphragmatic breathing, we also refer to that one as belly breathing. So this means that the stomach is fully engaged, the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm are engaged when you are breathing. So meaning during inhalation, what happens is that the diaphragm is pushed downwards. So this means, okay, this means that during inhalation, diaphragm will be downward. So your diaphragmatic breathing could help the lungs to expand properly. Okay, chest configuration. On your chest configuration, you need to check the shape of the chest and compare the anterior posterior diameter with the lateral diameter. Again, you compare the anterior posterior diameter with the lateral diameter. Of your this slide shows the problem that can be found on chest configuration. One problem is barrel chest. Okay, seen on the on the center of the slide. So when I say barrel chest, the shape of the patient's chest would look like a barrel in such a way that the anterior posterior diameter and the lateral diameter would have a ratio of 1 is to 1. Okay, this is common among patients with COPD. Okay, common among patients with COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. On your left is what we refer to as your funnel chest. 
Okay, if you can recall it, health assessment, this is referred to as pectus excavatum. So this is a condition in which the breastbone, okay, your sternum, is sunken into his or her chest. Okay, so this is oftentimes a congenital condition. So as you can see, it's sunken through the chest. Now, you also have the term pigeon, okay, or pigeon chest. For pigeon chest, it is referred to as pectus carinatum. Okay, it is also a rare deformity that causes the breastbone to be pushed outward instead of being flush against the chest wall. Okay, so sometimes they refer to this one as keel chest, okay, as in K-E-E-L chest. Now, the problem with your pectus excavatum and pectus carinatum is later on on the lung expansion, okay? Because of this abnormality, cardiopulmonary abnormalities in the mediastinum also occur. Next, you also have kyphoscoliosis. So your kyphoscoliosis is a combination of your kyphosis and your scoliosis. Since there is scoliosis, there is a sideway okay, curve or abnormal curvature of the spine. Since there is kyphosis, this is, there is also an abnormal curvature on the posterior aspect of the spine. So this is a combination of both kyphosis and scoliosis. So what's the problem? It can also lead to concerns on lung expansion. Next, for the patterns in respiratory rate, you might have heard of the terms chain stokes respiration, bias respiration, apnea, and then obstructive sleep apnea. Now, any change in the rate and the rhythm could be a sign already of your clinical deterioration for your patient. That's why we do not wait for the vital signs for the respiratory rate to go down very low before we address our patient's condition because these are first sign of clinical deterioration. Okay, so I'll be showing you the diagram for chain stokes. So for your chain stokes breathing, we expect a rapid cycle where the rate and depth of breathing increases, then decrease apnea, okay, until apnea, which is usually about 20 seconds. Other than that, the duration of apnea may vary and progressively lengthen. Whereas for your biots respiration, the periods of normal breathing followed by a varying periods of apnea. So in this case, for example, the patient is breathing one, two, three, four. Suddenly there will be apnea. Okay. Sometimes they refer to this as a toxic breathing associated with incomplete irregularity. So this is associated with respiratory depression, then drug overdose, brain injury. On the other hand, your chain stokes is indicative of heart failure and damages to your respiratory center, such as, okay, it could be drug-induced, it could be tumor, it could be trauma. Okay, take a Now we also need to assess for retractions. So when I say retractions, it is always considered abnormal. An asymmetrical mark retraction on inspiration could indicate a blocked respiratory tree. So meaning, for example, when I say asymmetrical mark retraction, if there is an intercostal retraction on this part, however, there is no retraction on this part, that would indicate that there is a block respiratory tree, okay? Meaning a major branch of the bronchus is affected. Next, you have hemithorax. When I say hemithorax, it is characterized by the asymmetric bulging of intercostal spaces on either side of the thorax. So for example, okay, this is your intercostal spaces. So when I say hemi, it means one hemisphere only. So there is bulging of intercostal spaces on either side of the thorax. So if one side is bulging, the other side is not, there is a problem on the side that is bulging. Okay? That may be caused by excess deposits of fluid or inflammatory processes inside. Next, okay, so this one is a showing hemithorax secondary to pleural effusion. As you can see, the left side of the lung is already full of edema, okay, full of water congestion. So this is an hemithorax okay, showing pleural effusion. So when I say pleural effusion, it is abnormal deposits of fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay, you might be wondering why this one is unilateral. This might be caused by a malignancy or an abnormal growth. Okay, so there might be a cancer here which cause for the deposits of fluid leading to pleural effusion. Now, palpation. During palpation, you check for tenderness. Okay? You also check for the vocal or tactile fremitus. You check for the presence of vibration, especially when your patient is saying 99. You check for the masses and swelling. 
So whenever you are palpating, you need to palpate all er all areas of the lung fields. Okay? So both anteriorly and posteriorly. Take note that your fremitus is felt during palpation. Okay? You refer to that one as tactile fremitus. Or you check for vocal fremitus. Now, crepitus. Crepitus is referred to as the crackling sensation. Okay, that crackling sensation is characterized or happened because of the air trapped in and under the skin, which you refer to as your subcutaneous emphysema. Okay, so your subcutaneous emphysema could be caused by your tracheostomy. Your tracheostomy could lead towards pneumothorax. How is it possible? Okay, your subcutaneous emphysema can result if there is tight closure of tissue around your tracheostomy too. Meaning the tube is very tight, there is tight packing material around the tube, and false passage of the tube into the pretracheal tissue. Now, if this happens, there will be pneumothorax. When I say pneumothorax, abnormal presence of air in the thoracic cavity. There may be pneumo mediastinum. When I say pneumo mediastinum, presence of air in the mediastinum, or both. Okay, and this should be treated by loosening. Okay, the closure or packing with the performance of tube thoracotomy. So what happens? This is a tracheostomy tube. No? So when there is too much tightening okay, in this tracheostomy tube here, and then the tube is not on the proper place, let's say it's on a pretracheal tissue, there is a possibility that the air would go under the skin. Okay, So that would result to subcutaneous emphysema. Okay, so this is an example of a subcutaneous emphysema. If you can recall the earlier images, this should be the skin already of the patient. But, at you, but as you can see, there are black spaces here, okay, which indicates presence of air. There is air trapping. Okay, again, that is your subcutaneous emphysema. Based on the case of this x-ray, this x-ray is taken from a patient who had tracheostomy who had subcutaneous emphysema. Is this life-threatening? Yes, of course. Okay, especially with the massive amount of emphysema, other than the discomfort and crepitus that the patient could have. Okay, there might be also impairment on breathing process. Okay, so this one is an example of a left pneumothorax. So when we say pneumothorax, there is abnormal deposits of air in the thoracic cavity. Okay, as you can say. Okay, there are no more bronchioles, okay, unlike this one wherein you can still see the branches of the main bronchi, the lower bronchi, and then the segmental bronchi. But for this one, this bronchi here could not be easily seen, okay, which is a result of atelectasis, okay, or your left pneumothorax. So left pneumothorax, there is abnormal presence of air in the thoracic cavity. Fremitus refers to the vibration of the chest wall produced when the patient speaks. Oftentimes, we ask the patient to say 99, and that would produce vibrations. Now, note that this vibration is affected by the transmission of sound, and the transmission of sound is dependent on the density of the substance. Okay, the more solid the substance is, the higher the tendency that the transmission will be easier. Okay, or the transmission of sound will result to louder sounds because the proximity of the molecules of your solid is uh, more close, more in close contact with one another compared to liquid and gases. Okay, that's why fremitus is said to be decreased in pneumothorax. Because in pneumothorax, what happens? Okay, there is atelectasis and air could not easily transmit the message 99 to the lower parts of the lungs. Also, the same in pleural effusion wherein there is excess presence of fluid and also the same for bronchial obstruction. Okay, so meaning if there is obstruction of the bronchus, the air could not pass through the bronchus. So the 99 could not be felt by the assessing nurse in the peripheral aspect of the lung fields. On the other hand, your fremitus is increased in the presence of pneumonia and abscess. Because remember your pneumonia and abscess, okay, both increase the density of the thorax. Now, percussion. Upon percussion, a healthy lung would appear to be resonant, okay, or would sound resonant. Remember, the normal sound of your lungs upon percussion is resonance, whereas if there is presence of 
lung tissue with fluid or solid, you would expect, expect dullness. Okay, dullness. So when I say dullness in the lung tissue, that might signal that there is presence of mass. That might signal that there are a lot of fluids being stored in the lungs. Okay, whereas if you will say that there is there is hyperresonance, hyperresonance could be an indication of air trapping. Okay, meaning there's too much air in your thoracic cavity. Next, respiratory excursion. So when I say respiratory excursion, it is a measurement as to how your diaphragm can go during inhalation. Okay, so what the doctor here is doing is actually percussing for the location of your diaphragm, okay, which should be a little bit lower. Now, in respiratory excursion, the normal is 5 to 7 centimeters. If you can recall, the doctor will first initially determine where the location of your diaphragm is. And then after that, once it is determined, it will be marked. And then you will be asked to inhale, okay? Once you inhale, you expect the diaphragm to be moving downwards. Now, once the diaphragm is moving downwards, you need also to determine where is the lowest moment, moment point, I mean, for uh, the diaphragm, okay? So you'll be doing your percussion to determine where the diaphragm is. Now, the normal respiratory excursion is 5 to 7 centimeters, which means the distance from the diaphragm's location during exhalation and then the diaphragm's location during inhalation. Your diaphragmatic excursion is decreased if the patient would have pleural effusion. Okay? Your diaphragm will be found to be high in thorax, meaning it moved upward if there is atelectasis, meaning there is collapse of the lung tissues. So, you would have no choice but to address that. Then you have diaphragmatic paralysis and then pregnancy. So diaphragmatic paralysis, of course, diaphragm not able to move. And then you have pregnancy. The contents of the abdomen is being pushed upwards to accommodate for the baby. Okay, so these conditions indicate that the diaphragm is high in the thorax. Now, auscultation. During auscultation, you would expect a lot of lung sounds. One is crackles. So your crackles is considered to be a soft, high-pitched, discontinuous popping sound, okay, detected during inspiration. So it is commonly found among patients with pleural effusion, heart failure, or pulmonary fibrosis. There are two kinds of crackles. So you have your coarse crackles and then your fine crackles. Your coarse crackles is characterized or defined as harsh, moist sound. Okay, which is usually detected early inspiration. Okay, origin, this can be found in the large bronchi okay, and common among patients with COPD. Remember, one problem in COPD is bronchitis. Okay, so that's why coarse crackles are expected to occur. Whereas your fine crackles okay, could be found in late inspiration, the sound is like the hair rubbing together okay, or your hair being rubbed with one another. Origin. So this is from the alveoli itself and then common among patients with pneumonia and restrictive pulmonary disease. We also assess for the presence of wheezing. Wheezing is defined as continuous musical sound, which is obvious in expiration, which is a signal of chronic bronchitis or bronchiectasis. So a sonorous wheeze, we oftentimes refer to as ronchi, stands for deep, low pitch sounds of use and expiration. So this is an indication of narrow tracheobronchial bronchial passages associated with secretions or could be tumor. A sibilant wheeze, on the other hand, is continuous musical high pitch. It's whistle-like, okay, which is common in inspiration and expiration. So this is seen among patients with bronchospasm, asthma, and build, uh, build up, I mean, of sick. We can also auscultate for friction rubs. So your friction rub is a harsh crackling sound. Okay, the sound is just like two pieces of leather being rubbed together. So this friction rub is brought about by the inflammation of your pleural cavity, okay, or such as your pleuritis and your pleural effusion, which is the excess of fluids in the pleural cavity. Now, on the voice sounds, there are several kinds of voice sounds, okay, also referred to as vocal resonance. So, for your voice sounds, you have bronchophony, egophony, and whispered pectorology. Now, to test for bronchophony, we test it using 99. Egophony, we test it using by asking the patient to say E. 
Okay, normally it should sound as A. And for whispered pectorology, we ask the patient to whisper some words and then we will be listening through the stethoscope. Whenever there is an increase in fluids, whenever there is consolidation in the lung fields, these sounds could be heard. Okay, these sounds could be heard. Okay, so these sounds could be heard clearly once there is consolidation or once there is too much fluid inside the lung cavity. So without fluids, your 99 will not be clear. Your egophony instead of E would sound A and the whispered pectoral K could not be easily audible. However, if there is presence of tumor or solid mass, they are very prominent through your stethoscope. Now, let's go to diagnostic evaluation. There are several tests that can be done to diagnose problems in the pulmonary system. Let's start with the non-invasive test. First is your smoke analyzer test or your exhaled carbon monoxide test. So this test is measuring how much carbon dioxide in the body is being excreted, okay? Or measures the carbon dioxide specifically in the body. So the test would be useful to monitor smoking and to help people to quit and it will show if exposed to dangerous levels of carbon dioxide because of secondhand smoke. So looking at the image on the right, this is just a handheld device. can be done on an outpatient basis. Then you have your Fagerstrom test. Okay, your Fagerstrom test is just a standard instrument which is used to assess the intensity of physical addiction to nicotine. So nicotine is the active substance that you can find in your cigarette. So as if you can see on the picture on your left, okay, that is the Fagerstrom test wherein the participant or the patient needs to answer yes or no. Okay, it's scored 0 to 1. Multiple choice items are scored 0 to 3. And then when they are summed up, they would lead to a score of 10. The higher the score, the more dependent the patient is on nicotine. Then we have culture. Okay, as mentioned, okay, when I say culture, culture is intended to identify the causative organism. For the respiratory tract, there are several routes for culture. It could be the throat, it could be the nose, it could be the nasopharynx. Then you can have the sputum specimen. The sputum specimen can be sent for microscopic examination. It can be sent for KOH examination. So when I say KOH examination, it is to rule out fungal specimens or fungal causation of disease. Okay? And it can also be sent for culture and sensitivity. Okay, so for your sputum specimen, it could be expectorated or through tracheal suctioning. So take note that your patient must be collecting sputum, meaning it should be from the lower respiratory tract and not saliva. Because during the test, there will no, the results from the saliva will not be reliable when it comes to the causation of disease, rather than if you have collected the correct specimen, which should be the sputum of your patient. So it can also help identify presence of organisms and cancer cells. There are patients who would have difficulty to collect the sputum. Once ordered or agreed upon by the doctor, you can give a pulmoid inhalation to the patient prior to collection of specimen for expectoration. Then you have sputum culture and sensitivity. So again, culture to identify the organism, sensitivity to identify the antibiotic that can be used to treat the organism. So as shown on the upper right, okay, you can see an example of culture through inoculation. Then you have sputum cytologic examination. As the term implies cytologic examination, it is an examination of the cells and its components. This is usually done under the microscope using a slide of the sputum specimen. Then you have your sinus and facial x-ray. So your sinus and facial x-ray is used to rule out presence of deformities. It can also be used to identify for the presence of sinusitis. So one example of an x-ray that can identify for the presence of sinusitis is your water's view x-ray. So this is an example of an image from a water's view x-ray. Okay, encircled there or marked by yellow line is your sinus or your maxillary sinuses. The shadow here indicates that there is air. Okay, this is the air, the dark space here, and then this one is fluid. So this fluid could be deposits already of past signaling infection. 
Okay? Other than that, you also have your chest x-ray. So your chest x-ray is used to evaluate the status of the chest and also provide baseline comparison. So as you can see, this is a chest x-ray showing a mass. Okay, this is also a chest x-ray showing mass and abnormalities. Now, CT scan. If I would look at x-ray and CT scan, the image again in CT scan is clearer compared to your x-ray. So your CT scan will be able to show pulmonary nodules and small tumors. Okay, pulmonary soft tissues densities, tumors, and blood clots could be easily seen. Okay, so for your CT scan, CT scan could be done with contrast or without contrast. For CT scan with contrast, your nursing intervention would be to assess the allergy of your patient. If your patient is allergic to iodine, if your patient is allergic to seafoods, you need to notify the physician for the possibility of postponing the procedure. However, if it will still continue, you need to ensure for the presence of antihistamine medications and anti-anaphylactic medications. Other tests, for example, laboratory, you can have your RBC count. So for your RBC count, remember that the purpose of your red blood cells is to determine or is to transport oxygen. Again, the purpose of your red blood cells is to transport oxygen. So whenever there is anemia or the decrease of your red blood cells, hypoxemia is expected to occur. Also, you have your arterial blood gas analysis. For your arterial blood gas, remember that your oxygenation is measured by the PaO2 or partial pressure of oxygen result that can be found in your ABG. Other than that, your alveolar ventilation is measured by your partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay, so meaning, if there is too much carbon dioxide, ventilation is not effective. Okay, so that is how we'll be measuring your alveolar ventilation. And then, of course, you have your entirety of acid-base balance because we know that the lung has a major function when it comes to the compensation of acid-base balance. Okay, also, your ABG is needed among patients with pulmonary or even non-pulmonary disorders who require artificial airway who will be dependent on mechanical ventilators. Okay, once the patient is attached or will be attached to the mechanical ventilator, among the tests requested is your ABG or your arterial blood gas. Now, there is your magnetic resonance imaging. For your magnetic resonance imaging, this is more detailed compared to your CT scan. So this could rule out or this could identify your bronchogenic carcinoma, highlighted the word stage. Because of the details brought about by MRI, it is already possible for the tumor or carcinoma to be staged. It can evaluate okay, inflammatory activity in interstitial lung disease, acute pleural effusion, and chronic thrombolytic pulmonary hypertension. So it's more of the microvasculature that can be detected by your MRI. It can also detect tumors, and the image could be made to be three-dimensional. Now, what are your contraindications? In this slide, I would want you to compare your CT scan and MRI. If you can notice, the MRI machine on the left shows a tunnel, okay? meaning the entire body of the patient would be fitted inside the tunnel okay, during the procedure, depending on the part that needs to be examined. Okay, On your right is a CT scan machine. For a CT scan machine, notice the donut shape of the machine. So between these two kinds of machine, you will be particularly worried about claustrophobia in your MRI and not in your CT scan. Because for CT scan, it's an open space. Okay. One of your nursing intervention that you must not forget during MRI is to inform your patient that whenever they have concerns, okay, you, they can call on you and you can hear them. Okay? Because there are MRI machines where in there, there is a built-in microphone okay, inside the MRI machine and then the patient just needs to press a button whenever the patient needs it. Okay? Also, prior to MRI, you need to assess for claustrophobia. Okay, or fear of closed spaces. Okay, so we don't have a choice. If ever the doctor would really warrant for an MRI, despite the patient having claustrophobia, one thing that you can do is to provide okay, for sedatives, is to provide for ansiolytics in such a way that the patient may be asleep while the MRI is being carried out. 
okay? Morbid obesity is only a contraindication there because the diameter of the machines could be, or the diameter of your MRI could not fit a morbid obese patient. Then confusion and agitation needs to be monitored. And then you have implanted metal or metal support devices. Once your patient has an implanted metal or metal support devices, your patient could not undergo your MRI, especially if I'm talking about your uh, pacemaker. If I'm talking about metal implants that could be magnetized. Okay, so take note of that. Next, fluoroscopic studies. In your fluoroscopic studies, it allows live X-ray images to be generated via a camera. Okay, so the keyword there is live X-ray images. So fluoroscopy can take series of X-ray images. It is used to assist with chest needle biopsy or transbronchial biopsy. Transbronchial biopsy. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so during chest needle biopsy, a needle is inserted. Okay, so for you to be able to identify correctly where the site of extraction will be, you need the guidance that could be either ultrasound or fluoroscopic. Also, this allows to study the movement of chest wall, mediastinum, heart, and diaphragm. That's why for this reason, your fluoroscopic study will be good to identify your diaphragm paralysis. And then, it would also be able to locate your lung masses. Now, pulmonary angiography. As the term implies, angiography, meaning it will check on the patency okay, of your blood vessels. So this is to investigate congenital abnormalities of the pulmonary vascular tree. Okay, now, contraindications. If your patient is allergic to dye, okay, you are not supposed to participate. Next, if your patient is pregnant, okay, your patient might need extra precautions or we need to make sure that organogenesis is already done. And then if there are bleeding abnormalities that might cause for the postponement of the surgery. Hence, you need to check for the bleeding parameters before you would start your pulmonary angiography. Nursing interventions prior to pulmonary angiography. So you need to check for consent. Remember, this is an invasive procedure. A dye will be given to the patient. You again assess for allergy because of contrast dye. You check for the coagulation panel. So depending on hospital policy, the coagulation panel may involve prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, clotting time, bleeding time, or if the patient is taking anticoagulants, your INR or international normalized ratio. Then you need to check for renal function test. Whenever you will be injecting dye to the patient, you need to check for the renal function test. That would include your BUN and creatinine. Okay, particular emphasis on creatinine. Usually, the patient is placed on NVO for 6 to 8 hours due to possible sedation during the surgery. Anxiolytics are given to minimize the anxiety of the patient. Okay, sympathetics are given to decrease discharges and then antihistamines also to relax the patient. Now, you need to check or you need to inform the patient that during the procedure, she might feel warm, she might have that flashing sensation or chest pain during the injection of the dye. Okay, so this is to be expected. Now, after your intervention or your angiography, you need to immobilize the punctured artery. Okay, what do you mean by that? If it is on the right arm artery that needs to be immobilized. Okay, because if it will not, it might be dislodged okay, or it might not promote healing of the said side. Now, you also need to monitor for vital signs, okay, the level of consciousness and oxygen saturation. Okay, so these are important because this can indicate progress of your patient's condition or if ever there are presence of complication during the angiography. Potential complications, okay? If the kidney is not functioning properly or if the kidney had an anticipated reaction towards the dye, there might be an acute kidney injury, okay? Acute kidney injury. Acidosis because also of the damage to the kidney. Cardiac dysrhythmias because remember, this is angiography. Okay, this would involve your heart. This would involve instrumentation. Okay, towards your blood vessels, especially going towards your lung. 
So during the instrumentation or the insertion of the tube, it is possible that dysrhythmia can occur. And then again, we've mentioned about bleeding, which can be prevented or expected using your bleeding parameter. The next test is your ventilation and perfusion scan, oftentimes referred to as your VQ scan. So V for ventilation and then Q for perfusion. So the image at the background of this slide shows the result of your VQ scan. On the upper portion is the perfusion, on the lower portion is the ventilation. So this test would use a radioisotope substance to assess for normal lung function pulmonary vascular supply, and then gas exchange. Now, when I say ventilation, remember that ventilation refers to the flow of air into and out the alveoli, while perfusion refers to the flow of blood to the alveolar capillaries. Okay? So again, when I say perfusion, it's about the flow of blood. When I say ventilation, it is more flow of air towards the alveoli. So, this test could identify the areas of the lungs being ventilated and the distribution of blood within the lungs. So that is your ventilation and perfusion scan. Now, gallium scan. Okay, gallium scan involves the use of gallium, which is also a radioactive substance. Okay, this is used for the evaluation of inflammatory conditions, abscesses, adhesions, and tumors. This could also be used to stage your bronchogenic carcinoma and tumor regression after chemotherapy or radiation. Okay? If you would look at the results shown on the background of the slide, this shows a condition that we refer to as sarcoidosis. Okay? This is sarcoidosis. It is a disease that involves the abnormal collection of inflammatory cells from the lumps known as granulomas. Okay? So what happened here is that Okay, there are deposits of inflammatory cells. Okay, we have, uh, they have been calling this as the panda sign. Okay, so that is for your gallium test. So this one, uh, this one for the panda sign and then the image on its left is known as case of sarcoidosis. Then you have your positron emission tomography or oftentimes we refer to as your PET scan. Okay, so it detects and displays metabolic changes in metabolism, or tissues, I mean. So you need to highlight the term there, metabolic, because it is among the function of your positron emission tomography. Also, it checks for nodules and malignancy, normal tissue from dead tissue differentiation. It also checks regional blood flow and distribution of medications. So when I say PET scan, the usual result of this will be a colored document or colored image which indicates the metabolism or usage of that substance to that person. Okay, so that is for your positron emission. Here are the nursing interventions for nuclear scans. So this would include your VQ scan, your gallium scan, and maybe your PET. Now, prior to the procedure, you need to orient the patient that an IV line will be inserted because the radioisotope substance will be passed through the uh, intravenous line okay added to that substances like this are usually tested through IV test enema an enema is given to ensure that the patient's bowel is already clean or clear especially if the patient will undergo gallium scan chest x-ray before VQ is done okay to serve as a pretest and for us to determine the size of the chest prior to your VQ scan during VQ and gallium scan radioisotope substances are used However, there is only a small amount of radioisotope. Hence, radiation safety measures are not generally indicated. Caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco are placed on hold for 24 hours because this can alter the metabolism of the substances used for our tests such as your PET scan. The patient is placed on NPO for 4 hours just to prevent the risk of aspiration, especially during the time that the patient will undergo your ventilation perfusion scanning and then your angiography. Okay? Now, you also need to check for uh, the use of catheter. Oftentimes, the patient needs to be on full bladder okay, to ensure absorption of these substances. However, later on, the patient might need to empty their bladder, hence you need to do your catheterization. 
after the procedure for to ensure drainage of the contrast media use or the radioisotope substance use, increasing the oral fluid intake would be necessary. Next, you have bronchoscopy. So, the term implies bronchoscopy, meaning through the bronchus. Okay, visualizing the bronchus using a scope. Okay, this is an insertion of a tube into the airways with the purpose of viewing the airway structure and could be used to obtain sample. So the sample can be used for biopsy. So as you can see on the slide, okay, there is a tube, a fiber optic tube in this case, inserted towards the airway and then going towards the bronchus. Okay, the purpose of this one is to visualize the lower respiratory tract structure. Prior to bronchoscopy, here are the things that needs to be prepared, okay? Being an invasive surgery, a consent is necessary. NPO for 4 to 8 hours is necessary because, remember, there will be an instrumentation in the airway. During the instrumentation or the insertion of the bronchoscope, the gag reflex may be activated. Hence, there is for aspiration. That's why the patient should be on NPO for 4 to 8 hours. Then, you have the administration of atropine. So, atropine is intended maybe to decrease the uh, secretions. Other than that, it could also inhibit your vagal stimulation. So, when I say vagal stimulation, this talks about your parasympathetic system. So, once this uh, uh, system is activated, it can result to bradycardia, dysrhythmia, and hypotension. Okay? For that reason, it needs to be inhibited. Okay, because we don't want bradycardia and hypotension to occur during the procedure. Now, it can also suppress your crack reflex, sedate the patient, and relieve anxiety. Further to that, okay, you need to make sure that the patient is not wearing any dentures or prosthesis. Okay, you also need to ask if what kind of anesthesia will be used by the anesthesiologist or gastroenterologist. Okay, gastroenterologist. For this case, lidocaine is usually used to spray on the pharynx. Local anesthesia or moderate is used, okay? Or local anesthesia or moderate anesthesia or sedation is used if there is fiber optic bronchoscopy. However, some patients would opt for general anesthesia, okay? Especially if it is the conventional bronchoscopy or the rigid bronchoscopy which is being used for the procedure. Okay, after the procedure, your patient should be maintained on NPO until there is cough and gag reflex. Once the gag reflex is back, you can give ice chips and then later on fluids. Okay, for an old adult, you need to watch out for signs of confusion and lethargy. This could be a sign of anesthesia overdose or this could be the sign that the patient's body is not able to excrete okay, the anesthesia. It is expected within the first 24 hours that there will be small amount of blunt pitch sputum because remember you inserted an instrument through the bronchus. So you would expect on the first 24 hours to be present is a small amount of blood pinch sputum. However, on discharge precautions, you still need to educate your patient that whenever there is sudden onset of shortness of breathing or bleeding, okay, they need to go back to the physician and they need to go back to the hospital right away. Next is thoracoscopy. The so term implies again thoracoscopy. Okay, so this is where the pleural cavity is examined with an endoscope and fluid and tissue that can be obtained for analysis. So basically, they have the same purpose of collecting the specimen. However, this one, thoracoscopy, Okay, is examined with an endoscope and fluid and tissues. So it, it also involves analysis, oftentimes done by the patients who are in doubt of their prognosis. For thoracoscopy, here are the nursing interventions that needs to be done. Okay, so you need to get a consent, remember. Okay, this is an invasive procedure with a lot of risk. You need also to maintain the patient on NPO. Now, post-op, you need to check on vital signs, the pain level, the respiratory status, bleeding, and infection. If the patient is complaining of shortness of breathing, post-thoracoscopy, you need to assume for the presence of pneumothorax. Okay, you need to assume for the presence of pneumothorax. 
whenever there is shortness of breathing after thoracoscopy. Now you have thoracentesis. So as the term implies, still on thorax, and then synthesis is um, excretion of fluids. So hence, thoracentesis. Now, thoracentesis means aspiration of pleural fluid or air from the pleural cavity. That can be used. Okay, that can be used for diagnosis and treatment. So oftentimes, if a patient would have a thoracentesis, the specimen battles are sent to laboratory for testing. Okay, then you have your ultrasound. So this one is, is an ultrasound guided procedure. Okay, this is an ultrasound guided procedure. What the doctor may be doing here is, okay, the doctor is holding a Doppler. It might be attached to an ultrasound machine where he is looking at the ECG findings. Okay, however, she also needs to be careful with the needle being injected. After your thoracentesis, you need to watch out for pneumothorax, especially within the first 24 hours. This is somehow an anticipated uh, complication that needs to be prevented. So when I say pneumothorax, it can be detected through your auscultation if there is diminished lung sounds during auscultation. Okay, that's why you can do it by comparing the two lung sounds bilaterally, okay, your left and your right. So you watch out for the following manifestations of pneumothorax. That would include pain on the affected side. Okay, there is feeling of air hunger. And then they would say that the affected side, there is no movement already for the lungs. And then there is tracheal deviation. So when I say tracheal deviation, okay, this means that the trachea is not on the midline. Instead, the trachea is moving towards okay, the center of the neck. Are moving towards the other side which is unaffected okay take note of that so if you have tracheal deviation that would signal that there is something wrong on the left side of the lungs for example the next term is uh, mediastinoscopy so in your mediastinoscopy okay a tube is being inserted through the chest wall above the sternum into the area of the upper chest between the lungs Okay, so as you can see here in the image, a bronchoscope is being already inserted, or sorry, a mediastinoscope, okay, which is a flexible tube, is already inserted towards your mediastine. Okay, so uh, this one is used to visualize also the structures there which are outside your heart and your lungs. Generally, this is done in the OR within general setting. Another diagnostic test is biopsy. Biopsy would involve the excision of a small amount of tissue on the specific part of concern to obtain sample for histologic analysis, culture, or cytologic examination. When we're talking about cancer, the diagnostic standard for cancer is biopsy. It can help us identify the type of cancer. If it is an infection, it can also help identify the underlying causative organism and then the inflammatory processes involved in the specific lung disease. There are different ways of collecting specimen for biopsy. So we have surgical and non-surgical. For surgical, you have your pleural biopsy. We also have your lung biopsy. For your pleural biopsy, we are using your pleuroscope. For the lung biopsy, it could be needle aspiration. Whereas for the non-surgical approaches, you have your transbronchial brushing. In your transbronchial brushing, there is a fiber optic bronchoscope it, in which and a brush is being uh, placed and this brush is uh, moved back and forth to collect the specimen. On the other hand, you also have your transbronchial needle aspiration because it says transbronchial, meaning it's through the bronchus and then if there will be uh, a tube inserted to the bronchus and then there is a needle at the end of the tube which can extract the specimen needed. Next, we also have your transbronchial lung biopsy. So again, it's through the bronchus, a bronchoscope, in, a bronchoscope inserted through the bronchus, and then the specimen will be collected using a forceps at the end of the tube. You also have your percutaneous needle biopsy. So this is percutaneous, meaning the needle is inserted through the skin of the patient, wherein there is excision of a tissue done, okay, through a spinal needle or a cutting needle for histologic study also under fluoroscope or CT guided. So it could be CT guided or CT scan guided or fluoroscopy 
guided or fluoroscopic procedure. Okay, the purpose of it is to ensure that the specific organ punctured is the right one. Then we also have your lymph node bi biopsy. So your lymph node biopsy could be used to detect spread of pulmonary diseases. Okay, towards the lymph nodes. Examples of this are your Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay, your sarcoidosis, maybe your fungal diseases, your tuberculosis, and carcinoma. Now, there are different kinds of tests also for our patient. One is your pulse oximetry. So for your pulse oximetry, it is a non-invasive method of monitoring the oxygen saturation of our patient. It identifies hemoglobin saturation, the normal value of which is at 95 to 100. Okay? However, if the value will be below 91 or below 86, it is considered an emergency. Take note that the pulse oximetry can detect desaturation even before the appearance of the signs and symptoms of poor oxygenation, which would include your dusky skin, your pale mucosa, pale or pale uh, blue nail beds. Okay, so before these symptoms would occur, your pulse oximetry would already be able to detect the decrease in the O2 saturations. So this is an example of your pulse oximeter. The one that you are familiar of is on the left. Okay. However, in more accurate settings, okay, or, or requires setting, settings that require higher degree of accuracy, the common machine use is uh, the type on the right side of the slide. Now, so the causes for low reading would include patient movement. Okay, if there is a decrease in the temperature in the extremity or hypothermia, decreased peripheral blood flow, ambient light. Okay, maybe sunlight or infrared lamps, decrease hemoglobin, edema, and then fingernail polish. Okay, also take note that there will be a problem on the reading of the pulse oximeter if the patient has carboxyhemoglobin. So when I say carboxyhemoglobin, it is hemoglobin binded to carbon monoxide. Okay, the pulse oximeter may be able to read a 100% reading on the pulse oximeter when in fact most of the red blood cells are already attached to the carbon monoxide, making it carboxyhemoglobin. So if you are suspecting for carbon monoxide poisoning, pulse oximeter is not a good indicator of your O2 saturations. Okay, you also have your pulmonary function test. So your pulmonary function test would evaluate the lung functions for the breathing problems. So this would include the volumes that we have discussed earlier, including your tidal volume, including your inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, your residual volume, and your vital lung capacity. Okay, this also includes your diffusion capacity, gas exchange, airway resistance, and distribution of ventilation. During this procedure, which is non-invasive, the patient is asked to inhale and then exhale using a machine. Okay, and then it will be recorded by the computer if how much or how many ml of air is being inhaled and exhaled by the patient. Okay, the test is usually done under the supervision of a pulmonologist or under the supervision of a respiratory therapist. Now, with all the data in mind, the following are the possible nursing diagnosis that our patient may have. One is ineffective airway clearance, okay, as evidenced by shortness of breathing. Okay? Ineffective airway clearance may be related to increase of secretions. Ineffective breathing pattern may be related to poor diaphragmatic excursion, whereas impaired gas exchange may be related to damages on the alveoli. Now, these three nursing diagnoses all pertain to airway and respiration you need to be familiar with the difference between these three nursing diagnoses for you to efficiently manage your patient. When I talk about ineffective airway clearance, the problem is the airway. Okay, So the common example is secretion, meaning the airway is not clear for the air to enter. Another concern there could be airway resistance. So if your patient is asthmatic, that is an airway clearance problem. Now, when I say ineffective breathing pattern, this is brought, uh, brought about, I mean, by hyperventilation, hypoventilation, occurrence of your Kussmaul, okay, chain stokes, or Biot's respiration. Okay? What is involved in your breathing pattern is the pattern itself. Okay? So you need to watch out for the pattern. Maybe you need to determine the rate, rhythm, and depth of respiration for your nursing problem ineffective breathing pattern to be justified. 
also breathing pattern is affected by your ventilation okay it is also affected by your ventilation involving inspiration and expiration you need to ensure that the diaphragm functioning or the diaphragmatic functioning is intact okay to resolve the problem on ineffective breathing pattern so this is evidenced by cough diminish abnormal sounds cyanosis also and restlessness impaired gas exchange impaired gas exchange problem usually involves the alveoli okay so impaired gas exchange related to alveolar maybe constriction okay alveolar inflammation as evidenced by cyanosis okay abnormal respiratory rate rhythm alar flaring tachycardia diaphoresis confusion one best diagnostic test that can prove that there is a gas exchange problem is your arterial blood gas results oftentimes this is the best way for you to justify your impaired gas exchange next there may be impaired spontaneous ventilation okay related to diaphragmatic problem still or maybe poor lung compliance as evidenced by dyspnea, use of accessory muscles, tachycardia, and apprehension. Disturbed sleep pattern related to okay, difficulty of breathing. You might have your uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And then anxiety. Anxiety could be related to feeling of doom, okay, related to diagnostic procedures such as your MRI. Anxiety may also be related to prognosis of the disease because they are afraid of the outcome of the disorder. Okay, With that in mind, Thank you for your kind attention. And we'd also like to acknowledge Professor Gesto as the source of the outline for this presentation.